This is David Barsamian, and welcome to a special program on Iran. We're going to begin the program with an interview with Shireen Ebadi. She was born in Hamadan, Iran in 1947. She received her law degree from the University of Tehran. She was one of the first female judges in Iran and was forced to resign after the 1979 revolution. In 2003, Shireen Ebadi uh, created uh, a sensation when she became the first Iranian and first Muslim woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize. She's a leading human rights activist and attorney. She continues to work in Tehran. Her new book is Iran Awakening. I talked with her in Denver on May 17, 2006. Shireen Shadi translated. Dr. Ebadi, I want to ask you about uh, the problem you had with publishing this book in the United States, Iran Awakening. من میخواستم این کتاب رو در آمریکا چاپ کنم ولی کن گفتن که I wanted to publish this book in the United States but since we had economic sanctions against Iran I was told that if I had income from the sale of this book I couldn't publish it and what I argued was that uh, by not permitting the publishing of this book you're actually censor, uh, censoring the people of the United States it's a censorship against them they won't be able to get all the information that I'm talking about in this book and this is against the Constitution of the United States um, and they did not accept my argument, so I had to go to court. I went to court, and I won the case in court. And now there are no cultural sanctions, not, e not only against Iran, there are no cultural sanctions, but against Cuba, uh, Cuba and, Su and uh, Sudan, there are no uh, sanctions either. Now, what does this make you uh, think about uh, President Bush when he's talking about democracy and freedom at the same time the U.S. military is in Afghanistan and Iraq. Democracy cannot be brought to a people with cluster bombs. Any military invasion or even the threat of military invasion harms democracy. 60% of Iran's population is uh, under the age of 25, and over 60% of the university graduates today are women. Uh, can you talk about the significance of young people and women in Iran today? Young people need employment, but the uh, rate of unemployment is high in Iran. Young people like freedom, but there is no freedom in Iran. So they don't feel very good in Iran. Uh, the women in Iran are better educated than the men in Iran. And they don't like the discriminatory laws that have been passed by the parliament. That's why they don't agree with their government either. What is the source of um, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's power? Who, who likes him? Uh, Mr. Ahmadinejad got 14 million votes, and this was in the second um, round. That, was the, that, that means his best. Whereas, pursuant to the statistics of the Ministry of Interior, 49 million people were qualified to vote in Iran. This means that 35 million people did not vote for Ahmadinejad, and 14 million did. Do you think uh, Rafsanjani offered uh, a real uh, difference uh, in terms of uh, opposing uh, Aga Ahmadinejad? Mm -hmm. Mr. Rafsanjani has been the president of Iran two times. He has also had other higher positions, like he's been the head of the parliament and he is the president of the Expediency Council. Uh, people had experience uh, with the policy that Mr. Rafsanjani was going to apply. They knew him, they had experience with him, and that's why they didn't vote for him. Talk a little bit about uh, Mohammad Mossadegh and the, the coup in 1953, which overthrew the democratically elected government. Mm -hmm. the, is that still an important factor 
in Iran today in influencing a public opinion about the United States? I have to tell you that Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh is the national, national champion of Iran and people will not forget about him. They all know that as a result of the 1953 coup organized by, the, uh, by CIA, he was toppled. The people of Iran believe that the nationalists have been weakened as a result of this coup, because it was after this coup that they were actually weakened. And she was only uh, six years old in 1953, but in her book she writes about uh, how she felt uh, at that moment. Yes, I remember that day when the news was broadcasted from the radio. People who were in the room with me became very sad, and some of them even cried. Iran has the fourth largest oil reserves in the world, the second largest natural gas reserves. Do you think uh, Bush is more interested in Iran's natural resources or the welfare of the Iranian people? I think that the answer to this question is easy. Mr. Bush should uh, think about the welfare of his own people first, specifically the Indians in his own country. And the interest of the people of the United States is that the military budgets be um, diminished and the money be used for the welfare of the people so that they can live better lives. What has happened in the Middle East is neither in the interest of the people of the United States nor in the interest of the people of Iran. It is only in the interest of some big corporations and arm producers. How do uh, average Iranis feel about the U.S. military presence in two countries bordering Iran, Afghanistan and Iraq? And how do the media in Iran cover the wars in Afghanistan and, and uh, Iraq? Uh, the people of Iran did not agree with in the invasion of Iraq, Iraq because the United Nations did not approve of it either. The situation in Afghanistan is, of course, different. The people of Iran believe that had the U.S. not helped the Taliban uh, to take power, then there would have been no need for them to come uh, and bring war to Afghanistan. How is she keeping busy these days? Is she still uh, doing legal work? Uh, Yes, that's my main job. I defend political pr prisoners in Iran pro bono. Uh, recently, uh, I read that you were looking through some documents, uh, uh, maybe in Switzerland? I'm not sure. And she, you found your own name in these documents uh, as a target for assassination. No, in the uh, Iran. Uh, no, this was in Iran. It was in the Iranian courts. At that time, I was representing the Furuhar family in a chain murder case, and that's where I came across this uh, piece of paper. Do you feel any fear for your own life? I believe that the fear is an instinct. It's like hunger. Without w willing to become hungry, you become hungry. And without willing to be scared, you are fearful. And so, to be honest with you, I have to tell you that I am scared. But uh, working under difficult conditions for years, I have learned how to control my fear and not let it impact my work. And every day, the Bush administration and the media in the United States uh, continue to make very threatening remarks uh, about Iran, even threatening military action. What message would you like to tell the American people about Iran? If there's some things they need to know that they don't know. <laughs> I want the people of the United States to know that the U.S. government has once committed a mistake and that was engineering a coup d'etat by the CIA. Also, at the time that Saddam Hussein was bombing Iranian cities, it was an, uh, Iraq was an ally of the United States and Rumsfeld went to visit Saddam Hussein and he shook hands with him. The foreign policy of the United States regarding Iran has been a mistake recently. 
البته قبول دارم که دولت ایران و مردم ایران هم اشتباهاتی کردن که از اون جمله Of course I accept that the people of Iran and the government of Iran have made mistakes too uh, for example uh, the hostage taking which was one of the mistakes that was done by uh, the Iranians and it's an embarrassing event that happened Uh, but now it's time to forget the past and think of a better future. The people of Iran and the United States have no differences. These are the governments who are fighting together. Uh, the governments have to resolve this, their disputes through negotiations. The negotiations should be direct and open. Uh, the reason that I insist that the negotiations should be public and open is that the people of Iran have a bad memory uh, from uh, negotiations that took place behind closed doors, like the coup of uh, 1953. Also, negotiations have to be uh, conducted at three levels, among the governments of both countries, the civil societies of both countries, and the parliaments of both countries. Iran and Farsi is a, a, a very rich language, and we know the poetry of Rumi and Hafiz and Attar. Do you like poetry? Does poetry uh, nourish your heart? بله من حتی خستگی روزانه رو همیشه با خوندن چند بیتشر از سن به در میکنم قبل از اینکه بخوام برم به رخت خواب. هیچ ایرانی نیست که به شعر علاق نداشته باشه. I don't think that there is an Iranian who does not uh, like Iranian poetry. And I, when I'm tired and I want to go to bed, I usually read a few poems and then go to bed. Do you remember one share that you'd like to tell? In Sher Maled Hafez, he says, Saghi be jam adl be deh baad ta gada qeyrat nayawarad ke jahan par bala konad. Okay. And this is a uh, poem from Hafez, and I hope I can translate it well, but it says that if there is, yeah, that if there is no justice, that those who are deprived may uh, take one day uh, to the streets and, and create a big uh, disaster. خلاصه این شعر این است که اگر بی ادالتی در جهان باشه مردم سر به اسیان می زنن. What it means is that if there is injustice in the world, people may insurrect. Thank you very much, Dr. Ebadi. Welcome. Merci. خواهش میکنم. An interview I did with Nobel Prize winner Shirin Ebadi of Iran, who was uh, visiting uh, Denver on uh, May 17th, 2006. Iran and the United States are on a collision course. The U.S. has never forgiven or accepted the 1979 Islamic Revolution. The overthrow of its satrap, the Shah, was a major blow to U.S. hegemony in the Middle East. That it came in a country with, with some of the world's largest oil and natural gas reserves made it doubly painful for Washington. The ensuing hostage ordeal was a humiliation. The Weekly Standard, the influential neocon journal, says the United States has a, quote, blood debt with Iran. Israel's Ariel Sharon advised the U.S. to go after Iran, quote, the day after Iraq is crushed. Well, slight problem there. Bush keeps saying that all options are on the table. Reports circulate of U.S. forces already operating inside Iran. Plans go forward on bombing. In the corporate media, dissident voices are rarely heard on this sub subject. Rather, putative experts from think tanks, many of whom have not been to Iran or speak Farsi, are regularly called upon to give their opinions. The only Iranian voices that are heard are former allies and supporters of the Shah. The result, a massive amount of distorted information and ignorance about an important country. Joining me here in our studios is Abdullah Dashti, he was born in Shiraz, Iran, and he teaches uh, anthropology and sociology at the University of Shiraz. He lived and worked in the United States for more than 25 years. He's a graduate of the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor and uh, taught there. Welcome to the program, Abdullah Dashti. Thank you very much, David, and greetings to your listeners. Well, you're from the hometown of Hafiz, uh, the famous uh, Sufi poet of... Um, 
Iran, as well as uh, the hometown of Saadi and uh, many other poets. Maybe you can talk uh, a little bit about the importance and the significance of uh, poetry in Iranian culture. Uh, definitely. Uh, poetry has been part of everyday life of uh, the Iranians or Persians. And as uh, Ms. Ebadi and uh, many other analysts on Iran acknowledge, uh, actually people, ev in every house there is a, uh, collections, a, a poetry co collections. Yeah, poetry collection, especially Hafiz and uh, side by side with Quran. You know, people who are religious, they have Quran as well as Hafiz. So um, there's Rumi also. Rumi also. Mm -hmm. So part of that mm -hmm. poetry has been uh, basically <coughs> uh, contributing to nation state building before, even before uh, the, the concept of nation state building in the world was being, uh, you know, being made in, in Western Europe. And, and then part of it is really uh, related to Irfan and Sufism. What is, is Irfan? Mm, Irfan is uh, different stages. Uh, those people who are religious think that uh, the stages that gets you closer and closer to God and also yourself. Because sometimes self and God is seen synonymously. Uh, so it's a kind of interesting ideology and philosophy to purify a person and thus to contribute to the whole society by individual purification. Uh, and uh, actually that Irfan and Sufism was responsible to spread Islam to many parts of the world, including North Africa and Nigeria and some other countries. Talk about uh, Iranian identity. Uh, it has, uh, the country has a unique language, Farsi, uh, a religion that is, uh, of course, Islam today, but has a historical background in Zoroastrianism. What makes, what are the components of Iranian identity? I would say now the, the old tradition, including part of Zoroastrianism, which became integrated into Iranian pre-Islamic culture. And after the coming of Islam to Iran, or some people who don't agree, they might say invasion of Arabs to Iran and bringing Islam, so depending on the interpretation, it uh, formed a sort of really interesting cultural amalgam and uh, formed a sort of identity which part of it goes back to uh, several thousand years ago, especially to 2,600 years ago when the first Iranian dynasty, Achaemenian dynasty, started with Cyrus the Great. And uh, uh, about... 1400 years ago when Islam came and uh, some of the uh, cultural forms or features were pushed aside which disagreed with Islam and combined with some form of Islam which is unique again to Iran and mostly to Iran and Lebanon and Iraq have that because is Islam has two main denominations Sunnism and Shiism and Shiism uh, was very different in some ways and created the political Islam which uh, led to Islamic revolution. And some people, including myself, uh, the way that analyze Iranian revolution, we say that probably without Shiism, the revolution would not have taken place or have not taken place the way that it did. Explain the importance of uh, the Prophet as well as the uh, family of Ali. Why is Ali so central to Iranian consciousness? Oh, surely. Uh, according to the Shi'i interpretation, uh, Muhammad, the prophet, after he, he actually uh, selected his... Uh, successor. Yes, his successor, uh, which uh, according to legends and according to some documents, it was Ali. But what happened, the situation in that time uh, didn't call for Ali's coming to power. So it was the system of, cal we call it caliphate system. After Muhammad, uh, three of his disciples, uh, Abu Bakr, Umar, and Usman, 
uh, took the caliphate, and uh, Ali, which was supposed to uh, immediately succeed uh, Muhammad, waited until uh, all those three uh, caliphs ruled the Islamic world back then, and then he came to power. So that's, uh, that's the point that uh, there is a division between uh, Sunnis and uh, Shiites. Shiites believe that uh, Ali was deprived from his righteous position as immediate successor, and then they, be they, they less believe in caliphate. They think that really it was usurped. And Ali, uh, except Ali as the first imam, uh, followed by 11 of his uh, descendants, uh, the first two being Hus uh, Hassan and Hussein. His and, sons? Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Ali had two sons. And by the way, Ali had married to uh, Prophet Muhammad's daughter. So these were... Uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad's uh, um, grandchildren. Uh, grandchildren, yes, uh, and then followed by uh, Ali, followed by eleven imams, and the twelfth imam, the last one, uh, is the one who disappeared. And in Shiite world, they expect uh, that one day he would return and bring justice. To the world. This is the so-called hidden Imam. Exactly, yes, hidden Imam. And imam did, is Aman. Did uh, Ayatollah Khomeini uh, sort of project himself uh, in Iran as the hidden Imam, or he, was he presented as such? Not really, no. Uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, when he came back to Iran, uh, at the first he was uh, unwilling even to be called the vice Imam, means someone who is paving the path for Imam Zaman or the 12th Imam, uh, less, less so that he will be willing to be called 12th Imam. No, I think he, he actually objected to that. And, uh, but the political situation was in a way that uh, eventually he was called the Imam, but not meaning the 12th Imam, but one of the descendants of Prophet Muhammad and Ali, who paved the way through the revolution for uh, the emergence or reappearance of the 12th Imam. And why do you say that um, Shia was uh, Shia Islam, which is the dominant uh, Islam in Iran, was a key to the revolution of 1979, which overthrew the Shah? Okay, there are several reasons, but I mentioned just two of them. One that according again to Islamic uh, uh, analysts and interpreta interpreters, uh, Shiite Islam, uh, I would say in contrast with the Sunni Islam, has the door to interpretation open. Means for Sunnis, according to some sort of readings, the Quran and the documents are the ones on the basis of which uh, they do interpretation. But in Shiism, uh, the system of ayatollahs means those religious uh, scholars who are sometimes equivalent to PhDs in uh, other sciences, but in religion, uh, they are in the position to reinterpret sometimes uh, not, not the principles, but some of the uh, minor principles of Islam. So that's one important thing, means they can really reread the new world and the processes, social, political, economic processes, in accordance with their reading of Islam, which makes it, uh, le which makes it more, more flexible. And uh, the second important, and probably I would say the most important, is uh, the story that we have about Imam Hussein, who uh, fought against the Yazid, back then a caliph who followed uh, his father, Ali. And through this war, the, the war, according to this, in, this interpretation, is, is really about defending uh, justice. Means that uh, Imam Hussein taught he's living under some oppressive situation. And according to Islam, if you are living, or Shiism, if you are living under oppression, you have to rise, otherwise you are a big sinner. So 
when uh, Ayatollah Khomeini defined the situation in Iran as very oppressive and people who are living under oppressive situation should rise, otherwise they are guilty of uh, compliance with the dictators and with the oppression, oppressors, uh, I think it was a very uh, strong tool to mobilize a large segment of the population and overthrow the Shah. Of course, the story is much longer, much complicated, but now we are making it as simple. That's the voice of Abdullah Dashti. This is KJNU Boulder, 88.5 FM, KJNU Denver, 1390 AM. It's a minute past the hour of 9 o'clock. I'm David Barsamian. Professor Dashti, um, often comments are made about um, the overthrow of the democratically elected government of Mohammed Mossadegh in a coup led by the CIA in 1953. Uh, there's a new book out called Guests of the Ayatollah. It's almost 700 pages. It's by Mark Bowden, who's the author of Black Hawk Down. And it, it is an account of the seizure of the U.S. Embassy uh, in Tehran on November 4th, 1979, and the ensuing 444 days of captivity and, and all the attention that that attracted. So the book is primarily about that, but uh, I was interested uh, in looking in the index that there were only four references in this almost 700-page book to Mohammed Mossadegh. Uh, do you think those events in 1953 uh, had a big impact on uh, the politics in Iran, not just bringing the Shah back from exile and putting him again on the peacock throne, but what ultimately happened in the country. Oh, definitely. I think at the beginning of the interview you mentioned, and you had a very good point, that a lot of books come out, and I would call them cheap journalism, because really good journalism is really good too, but these, some I'm not uh, referring to Mark Bedouin's book necessarily, but some of these books write things out of historical context, and you can't do that because the historical context shows a sort of continuity and discontinuity in politics and how different forces are active in shaping uh, history. So given that, I would say uh, that overthrow of Mossadegh became a very strong uh, part of hi Iranian historical consciousness means something that really you cannot easily erase it from the Iranian memory. Uh, also, it uh, really links to 26 years later with the Iranian revolution. Of course, if, I mean, even if you work with ifs a little bit, if Mossadegh had not been overthrown, probably Iran would have been a sort of... Um, a liberal capitalist country uh, and the whole story would have been different than when the Shah came back and uh, the dictatorship intensified immensely uh, and you know the story well and some American people probably have read and know that during the, the, these 26 years when Shah came back and was overthrown in 79 there was horrendous uh, uh, amount of uh, repression. According to some statistics, 100,000 Iranians were assassinated, executed, and 100,000 were in the prisons, and 100,000 were outside the country. So that was kind of uh, little statistics about that time, with which Iran had only 15 to 18 million population. Uh, Noam Chomsky, uh, in his book *Imperial Ambitions*, uh, talks about. Uh, this period uh, in the early 1950s, he says, the issue in Iran was that a conservative national nationalist parliamentary government was attempting to take back its own oil resources. These had been under the control of a British company, originally Anglo-Persian, later named Anglo-Iranian, which had entered into contracts with the rulers of Iran that were pure extortion and robbery. The contracts gave the Iranians nothing, and the British were laughing all the way to the bank. Mohammad Mossadegh was a long-standing critic of this subordination to imperial policy. 
The British and the Americans wanted to continue robbing the Iranians blind, and that led to a tremendous popular uprising in support of nationalization. Then Chomsky goes on to say that Iran had a long democratic tradition, including a majlis, uh, a parliament. Uh, this goes back to the early 1900s. Um, yes, that's, that's true. After the uh, constitutional revolution, the constitutional revolution which took place in 1909, uh, really constitutionalized the absolute monarchy. But that was short-lived because Iran has uh, a dictatorial past even before that. And this uh, dictate, uh, this democratic, uh, I would say, moment in Iranian history lasted probably only a decade after Reza Shah comes to power in Iran and uh, terminates the Bajar dynasty Again, we are confronted with a modern sort of dictatorship, which is little different from the traditional fort of Qajar Shah and the dynasties before that. But really, uh, the, in Iranian history, you don't see uh, a lot of moments of democracy. Maybe at the time of Cyrus the Great, people talk about how these Shahs were th thinking they are part of the people, and the difference was not immense in terms of uh, creating distinct uh, political distinctions. And then at uh, one short period during uh, another dynasty, which was Zand dynasty, there was um, a guy called Karim Khan Zand who even didn't call himself king. So uh, I would say uh, Chomsky is correct to that extent, but uh, he exaggerates on the amount of democracy in Iran. The New York Times uh, ran an editorial right after the uh, coup, praising it, and it, and it said, Undev underdeveloped countries with rich resources now have an object lesson in the heavy cost that must be paid by one of their number, which goes berserk with fanatical nationalism. Uh, one can only think about Hugo Chavez today in Venezuela and Evo Morales in uh, Bolivia, who are also talking about uh, using the resources of natural resources of their countries for the benefit of the peoples of uh, those countries. Yeah, just one small point on uh, Noam Chomsky's uh, point that he made in his book. Uh, you know, in 1906, when oil is discovered and the British take over as monopolistic uh, contractors, uh, Basically, as he, he's, he's correct, that really they don't uh, abide with any of the items on the contract. For example, uh, training uh, Iranian engineers to be uh, to extract oil themselves, education, and basically the oil production in Iran has become an economic enclave. Even the workers were brought from India rather than Iran, so it was not integrated into Iranian. Uh, society and economy at all. But when the British, um, when Mossadegh in 1951 uh, becomes prime minister, and before that he was a deputy in the Majlis fighting against the Shah, so when he comes to power actually and nationalizes the oil, so British are kicked out. And here it's interesting, it's not an alliance between the United States and British to take over back. Here, a sort of rivalry between the British and the United States, because U.S. was happy at the beginning that the British had left, and uh, she can fill up that gap as a new contractor, a new uh, monopolizer of Iranian oil. Uh, and since that doesn't happen, and uh, Mossadegh is very intransient about Iranian oil interest, uh, then they go against him, and CIA basically uses Kermit Roosevelt, which is the uh, grandson, uh, grandson of Theodore of, Roosevelt, exactly, distant cousin uh, of FDR yeah. as well. Yes, yes, and actually he architects the Iranian uh, coup d'état. He was the over. CIA officer, exactly. Operation Ajax. I think he was, yeah, the, the, was the station officer, yeah, the station director. Well, speaking of uh, the CIA and you know the brilliant work uh, they've done recently in Iraq on uh, weapons of mass destruction, mobile uh, biological labs, et cetera, et cetera. Well, they have a, quite a track record of uh, brilliance. Uh, in August of 1978, just six months before uh, the overthrow of the Shah, uh, 
This is what the CIA said. Iran is not in a revolutionary or even a pre-revolutionary uh, situation. Uh, an amazing uh, analysis. Uh, Jimmy Carter, the president of the United States, in that same year, uh, praised the Shah and expressed his admiration for him and said he was much loved by the Iranian people and he called Iran an island of uh, stability. Uh, how could the Americans have so missed uh, the reality of what was going on in Iran? I believe being ignorant of the culture as well as uh, the social psychology of the people would lead to that. I would uh, go even beyond that, not only Carter and CIA, but the Shah himself, he thought he's really loved by the people. And when he used to go and they had these uh, made demonst demonstrations for him and forced the uh, university students or college students, primary school students and civil servants to come uh, to welcome him, uh, it really made uh, him thinking that people love him. So the outside eyes also saw the same thing, that there were a lot of things were boiling below that only with good analysis and good research could have been discovered. And I think neither U.S. nor uh, Shah's supporters were in a position to understand all these little uh, processes which then, then gathered momentum and overthrew him. Actually, he thought, at, at the beginning, he probably he was really surprised. <laughs> These people loved me. What happened in, overnight? But it wasn't overnight. It had a long history going back even to Mossadegh's time. That's why they are linked. And I think it's been uh, commented upon that he was surrounded by what uh, we call in American English yes-men, people that praised him and said, you're terrific and you're doing a great job and, and um, it, it's, there seems to be some parallels today with the um, current uh, occupant of the White House who uh, is also surrounded by people that give him um, a lot of flattery. Uh, possibly so, yeah. I would say probably in Iran it was more exaggerated form. The uh, Shah was much more ignorant maybe than Mr. I, I mean, it's it's hard to com compare, but at least I think uh, Mr. Bush maybe is a little more aware, but he's more compliance or in agreement with the sort of advice that he's given. But of course, the circle of advisors and people who are around a ruler can shape definitely his opinions very, uh, and in crucial situations like wars as well, which might lead to unfortunate results. On January 29th, 2002, in his State of the Union address, uh, George Bush uh, included uh, Iran along with uh, Iraq and North Korea as part of the axis of evil. Um, according to a book written by Dilip Hero, the Iranian labyrinth, uh, this announcement by Bush actually uh, shocked uh, Tehran uh, because uh, Iran had been cooperating uh, with the United States uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, Iran was uh, an avowed uh, opponent of the Taliban, almost went to war with the Taliban in, in 1998 and helped support uh, the U.S. Uh, attack uh, on Afghanistan beginning in uh, October of 2001. Iran was, again, according to Dilip Hero, uh, they work, Iran worked closely with its American counterpart part in Bonn to install, install Hamid Karzai as leader of the post-Taliban interim government in Afghanistan. And Tehran pledged over half a billion dollars in aid to Afghanistan uh, over the next five years. Uh, what do you think about um, of that? You know, sometimes uh, new administrations want to put this stamp of political identity on their own administration. And I think this was one of the uh, mistakes of uh, Bush's uh, early uh, statements and policy, uh, considering that I think Israel has a lot of influence on U.S. decision-making, especially in, on foreign, in foreign affairs, Iran was seen for many years as supporter of terrorism, which uh, uh, formally 
uh, Iranian government denies it, and they say if we are morally supporting Palestinians, uh, that's just on moral level. No weapons, no soldiers, no th that way. And moral support, they do it on the religious ground. So um, as we go back even to what Reagan said, Reagan was calling um, counter-revolutionaries, Nicaraguan counter-revolutionaries, freedom fighters. So if we relativize <laughs> this sort of idea, someone's freedom fighter might be another uh, person's terrorist. And this is debatable. This, these are not the absolute truth. But unfortunately, Bush administration has been tried, and I think uh, probably might fail in that, to exert some of the realities in the world as absolute truth or make them as real facts, which are not. These are uh, issues which can be debated, and uh, Iraq, Iran, and uh, North Korea were completely different uh, countries with different agendas, and uh, that was not um, very well in improving the relationship that Khatami was doing. Khatami, uh, with a good will, entered into Iranian politics to improve Iran, Iran's image in the world. And if Iran and U.S. Uh, could have come closer, that at Clinton's time, uh, actually it worked a little better uh, on the world agenda, but later with the coming of Bush, it destroyed that s those steps that were taken uh, mostly by Khatami and partly by Clinton administration to bring these two countries and people closer. Khatami was uh, elected in 1997. He was yes. later uh, re-elected. Well, how much of what the saber-rattling that's going on today and the threats, uh, real as... Uh, quite real. Um, the U.S. is now dedicated, according to Le Monde, um, $85 million um, to boost what it calls democracy programs uh, in uh, ir Iran. How much of this is payback for the overthrow of the Shah and the, the hostage crisis? I would say very, very little. And I think even though we have a lot of room for improvement in Iran, in contrast to some other countries, if we look at democracy not in absolute terms, it has made uh, some progress. For example, at Shah's time in Iranian parliament, there wasn't any debate. Most of the decisions were already uh, taken. It was showcase. But at this moment, according to some analysts, which are not pro-regime anyway, there are debates are taking place. So it's not as simple as that, that some decisions are taken in advance. So it's, it has a kind of interesting uh, uh, sort of process. But as in the United States, in Iran too, we are far away from democratic gains. So I would uh, believe that it would be fine if we don't look at uh, the United States as the cradle of democracy, because we are not. <laughs> there are a lot of improvements should be made also in Iran the same way. So a country which does not, has not gained uh, full democracy or a sort of complete democracy that's satisfying to all its citizens uh, wants to sponsor democracy in other country, it seems a little ironic. The U.S. Uh, advocated and affected the regime change in Kabul and in uh, Baghdad. Do you think a war is going to happen? Mm -hmm. uh, the possibility always exists, but I think if uh, Washington thinks more carefully, the situation would, wouldn't be as easy. Iranian regime is not Taliban, Iranian regime is not Saddam, and I think uh, despite some disaffection with Iranian government, uh, the Iranian government or regime can mobilize tremendous amount of uh, resources and people if there is there is a war. So it would not be to the benefit of either country. And I think, uh, uh, like one of the commanders of um, uh, Revolutionary Guards, I mean, I don't like his comments, but he made the comment that if U.S. touches Iran, all oil fields in Persian Gulf would be on fire. 
So I think they would go, there are some very, uh, I, w- I wouldn't call them fanatic, but they believe in the regime so much and Islamic revolution because it's, it goes beyond the material life and some are real in it. And there are some sincere people who would take actions which would be very, very unpredictable. Saddam was a coward dictator. <laughs> he wanted his own life. But uh, if uh, we are familiar with the philosophy of martyrdom in Shiism, I think it would be a completely different story. In June of 2005, uh, Mah- Mahmoud Ahmadinejad uh, is elected president of uh, Iran. Uh, talk about uh, Ahmadinejad. What do you know about him? Ahmadinejad, I know that he was a university professor teaching at Qazvin's university. And later he got involved in politics because he worked with Pasdar or with the, the Revolutionary Guards during the war. And the war was with Iraq. The war with Iraq, Iran-Iraq war. And he was doing some of the engineering projects because his field is a uh, technical field. Uh, then I believe he was the governor of one of the provinces and he became... Um, Mayor of, Mayor of Tehran, mm-hmm. uh, af- after Karbasji was uh, deposed from that post, and he was there for a few years. Uh, and actually, one once on a bus ride, I saw one of the uh, commander or um, retired commander of National Guards uh, who was going to Isfahan and I was going to Shiraz, and he talked uh, a lot of interesting things about the... Um, uh, Ahmadinejad, that early in the morning sometimes he goes and work with the uh, clean the streets together with very low echelons, eat lunch and dinner with them, and I think it popul- uh, made him a popular figure in uh, the municipality of Tehran, which is a huge organization. And then after uh, the Pasdaran or Revolutionary Guard decide to run some of their own. Uh, the list are four people. Uh, Larijani is one, was one of them, and Rizai, who was the uh, previous Revolutionary Guard commander, was one. So anyway, four people uh, from Revolutionary Guard uh, were candidates. And I think they decided on Ahmadinejad. So Ahmadinejad, uh, the first round, there were eight candidates. No one gained the majority for the runoff. Uh, there were two. Ahmadinejad and Rafsanjani. From 25 million votes casted, uh, Ahmadinejad got 15 and Rafsanjani 10, and he won. Iran is a signatory to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, and as such, under Article 4, has a right to enrich uh, uranium. Now there is a a huge controversy uh, around uh, this issue. I should add that At the same time, Israel, Pakistan, and India are not signatories to the NPT and have developed uh, nuclear weapons, have weapons of mass destruction, and go uh, unimpeded in developing uh, more weapons. But Iran uh, is a signatory to the uh, NPT, and the International Atomic Energy uh, Agency, the IATA, um, in Vienna has now uh, recommended to the Security Council uh, Iran for some kind of uh, censure. Censure. Uh, what's going on there? Unfortunately, the pressure of U.S. on different uh, international agencies, including the United Nations itself and all of its uh, uh, subsidiary agencies, has been really great. And I think, uh, personally, uh, you know, I'm one of the believers that the chances of developing atomic bomb may not be that great because Iran has made some suggestions including uh, Ahmadinejad suggested that any country in the world who want to cooperate with us to develop our uh, peaceful project of nuclear energy welcome to cooperate with us so if the world you know some of the countries which are suspicious of Iranian project want to cooperate they can take on this suggestion which was made internationally. So Iran cannot really, uh, you know, reject that uh, suggestion for cooperation. So if they do that, it seems to me the thing is resolved. And they have uh, offered some mechanisms for overseeing the project of 
nuclear development. So a lot of people in Iran also believe that the project is for peaceful means rather than developing nuclear weapons. Recent cover photos of uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, uh, one on Newsweek and one on The Economist, uh, show him in a, in a very uh, menacing, threatening uh, kind of uh, gaze on his face. Uh, unstoppable Iran's nuclear ambitions, The Economist mm -hmm. uh, wonders aloud. And there's a picture of a, of a missile. Uh, if one were just to transpose uh, Saddam Hussein or... Osama bin Laden or Gaddafi or Noriega uh, from previous cover stories, um, they would be almost identical. Um, he is now the enemy du jour. Oh, yes, in that sense. That's true. And I think he's a very serious person. I've seen him rarely uh, laughing or smiling. So overall, he's pretty serious. But I have seen him that, uh, you know, in joking ways and also laughing. So it's not just that's probably it was a, a situational thing. He was taking pictures and or some formal talks. So he had his uh, serious uh, feature or outlook. Well, what kind of support does he have in the country? Um, that's really difficult to gauge. <laughs> but from the commentaries that I've heard, it seems he has gained some popularity that he didn't have before. For example, as a result he, of as the a result US of some of, as a result of uh, oh that one one factor, but uh, as a result of some of the actions that he has taken himself. For example, he raised the salaries of retirees in Iran. And uh, for example, I talked to a woman who was middle class, very modern, uh, with a scarf, most of her her hair showing, but uh, she said, oh, I like Ahmadinejad. I said, why? <laughs> she said, because he's thinking about us. Or, for example, he has taken his cabinet meeting to different provinces, starting with the most deprived province and addressing the local issues on provincial level. And I think it had added to his uh, popularity. But really, to gauge that, we have to do a poll <laughs> or something. Um, but Magus is he's now more popular. He has done some stuff, not all the things that he promised because he was not realistic about Iranian economy. You know, for example, the inflation rate, which is about 27 percent, he was trying to make it one digit. Uh, he has not been able to do that. He reduced um, the rate of mortgage in state banks, uh, but he couldn't make it one digit that he promised. So he had done some, but not quite what he planned to. One last question. With sure. oil at seventy, seventy-five dollars a barrel and Iran possessing uh, some of the world's largest reserves, why isn't that money going right into the Iranian economy and benefiting the general population? To some extent it does, but unfortunately this is part of the black uh, images of Iranian society and economy. There are some corruptions, uh, some people who use political leverage in order to gain personal uh, benefit from oil money or from other resources in Iran, which is really sad. But apparently they have done some projects and uh, they claim to improve Iranian situation. We'll see. I've been talking to Abdullah Dashdi. He's a professor of anthropology and sociology at the University of Shiraz in Iran. Thanks very much, Professor Dashdi. Thank you very much. I'm Thanks David Barsam. I'm David Barsamian. Thank you for listening. You're tuned to listener-supported KGNU. Coming up at noon today on Metro, author, activist, and Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel will be Karen Hammer's guest. Karen will also be talking with Tony Platt, author of Bloodlines, recovering 
Hitler's Nuremberg Laws from Pratt Patton's Trophy in Public Memorial. Those two topics today on Metro. That's at noon at 6 o'clock this evening on our Thursday call-in program of a conversation about senior citizens and driving. It represents independence to the folks who are at risk of losing their driver's license, but uh, people on the other side argue that it's a important safety issue. Seniors and driving tonight at 6 on the Thursday call-in show. 9.30 at listener-supported community radio. Stay tuned next for the Morning Sound Alternative.